So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, pleasure to have you all here. I uh, must say I'm a little excited about today and uh, what's going to happen this afternoon. And I'm pleased today to uh, present to Albertans uh, Budget 2015. Uh, this budget is the first under the leadership of Premier Jim Prentice and is going to mark a new direction for the province of Alberta. <clears throat> it's been guided by our 10 fiscal principles and includes, for the first time, a detailed five-year plan in conjunction with a 10-year vision. By this time, you're all familiar with the fiscal realities facing our government and the need to make tough decisions with this year's budget. The drop in oil prices we have seen caused a severe drop in revenue for Alberta and this has forced us to take a hard look at our operations. We have also worked hard to help Albertans understand the situation that we face. Through our speaking tour, our online survey, and meeting with stakeholders, thousands of Albertans have reached out to government with their thoughts on how to handle our fiscal situation. I heard support for tax increases. I heard from people adamantly opposed to them. I heard from people who feel our spending is out of hand and want deep cuts. And I've heard from frontline staff who say they need more support, not less. Ultimately, what Albertans want is balance, long-term stability, and strong leadership. Budget 2015 reflects this with a measured approach that does not steer too hard in any one direction. We understand that Alberta is in a vulnerable position right now and reactionary decisions could cause more harm than good. This is the kind of feedback we receive both from economic experts and everyday Albertans. We are using three levers, spending restraint, enhancing revenue, and using savings in the contingency account to move us to a more solid fiscal foundation. This is the balanced approach that Albertans want and our economy needs. It would be an understatement to say Alberta's economy has shifted in recent months. Thousands of jobs have been lost. Billions of dollars in private sector investment have been suspended or cancelled. The price of oil collapsed more than half its value since June, and we don't expect prices to return to levels reached last summer. We are also projecting natural gas prices to be even lower than last year. Non-renewable resource revenue will make up less than 7% of the total government revenue in this budget. Revenue, resource revenue is forecast at $2.9 billion, 67% lower than last year and the lowest level since 1988-99. All of this has resulted in the government forecasting that Alberta's GDP will grow by only 0.4% this fiscal year. We forecast that employment levels will grow a full percentage point to 5.7% even as more people continue to move to our province. As part of our five-year fiscal plan, we forecast a return to surplus budgets within three years. For budget 2015, let me address how government is holding the line on our spending. This has not been an easy budget to prepare. We have said tough decisions were needed and we've made those decisions. Alberta spent approximately $1,300 more per capita than the national average on programs and services in 2013-14. We must move our expenses closer to the national average to remain sustainable in the coming years. As such, government is holding spending essentially flat at 2014 levels with some funding being repositioned across ministries. Some ministries will need to make do with less, others face tremendous pressures, will see increases but they will be below population growth and inflation levels. They will need to absorb significant cost pressures. This is not a small undertaking. Alberta's population and economic growth continues to put pressure on programs and services. However, we must balance that demand against government's ability to afford them. Our spending must be prudent, focused and thoughtful. I'm confident the various ministries will accomplish this difficult and challenging task through a combination of ways. I want to return now for a minute to, to what we have heard from Albertans as we consulted about the budget. This province has grown tremendously in the last several years and that's put a strain on our infrastructure. However, this government knows that cutting back on capital spending will only cause more problems down the road and Albertans want to keep building the roads, bridges and buildings they need. I'm pleased to announce that the government will spend $4.8 billion over the next five years for maintenance and upkeep needs. That's nearly triple what we have been spending. This money is part of the $29.5 billion in the five-year capital plan. Maintaining our AAA credit rating is essential. However, with low interest rates, it makes sense to borrow to continue building, especially in an economic downturn when labour may be more available and costs are lower. Some of the highlights in this capital plan include $7.9 billion in municipal infrastructure support, including MSI, 
$6.7 billion for roads and bridges, including continuous funding for Calgary and Edmonton Ring Roads, and the twinning of Highway 63. $5 billion for building new schools and maintaining existing ones. $926 million for health care planning and capacity expansion in Edmonton and Calgary. $779 million in flood recovery and mitigation projects and the maintenance and renewal funding mentioned earlier. This spending reflects Albertans priorities, allows us to provide the infrastructure needed to deliver services, attract investment and provide for a growing population. As I said at the beginning, Budget 2015 is about balancing our actions. This approach meant we would have to examine our revenue makeup and consider changes. We asked Albertans what kind of changes to wherever they would support and clearly remained opposed to provincial sales tax and we're not introducing one. We also understand the precarious situation many of our small and large businesses are facing. Thousands of Albertans have been laid off in the past few months and many other companies are trying to protect what jobs they can and continue operating. Government will not add to their burden and risk more layoffs by increasing corporate taxes or changing our royalty structure. This is not the time to put more pressure on businesses. So we looked at other options. We know health care is the largest expense in our budget. <clears throat> budget 2015 introduces a new health care contribution levy. And I must say it is not a premium and is not structured like the former health care premium which was eliminated in 2008. This new levy will be administrated through the personal income tax system. It will not be payable by employers. To help shield low-income Albertans, students and the vulnerable, the new levy will only apply on taxable income of more than $50,000 and will ri rise based on income. It will be capped at a maximum of $1,000 a year for people earning $130,800 or more. Anyone earning less pays less. Introducing a levy like this is not a step we take lightly. Albertans understand the need for health care funding. Also, as a part of Budget 2015, we examined many of our consumption taxes and have made adjustments to increase them. In many cases, this will be the first increase in decades for these taxes. The revenue collected has greatly depreciated against inflation. The changes include increasing the fuel tax by four cents to 13 cents total. It's been 24 years since this tax was increased and it will still be the lowest in Canada. Tobacco taxes are increasing and the liquor markup will also increase to generate more revenue. We expect these changes to bring in more than half a billion dollars in additional revenue for the government. When it comes to personal income taxes, our recent cons consultations indicate Albertans want higher taxes at higher income levels. We will maintain the 10% tax for the majority of Albertans while phasing in two higher rates over three years. Taxable income below $100,000 will not be impacted by personal income tax changes and will continue to be taxed at 10%. Effective January 1, 2016, taxable income of more than $100,000 will be subject to a 0.5% increase each year, totaling 11.5% after three years. Additionally, taxable income of more than $250,000 will be subject to an extra 0.5% rate each of those three years. We are asking those who can afford it to pay a little bit more. All of these revenue changes will provide an additional $1.5 billion in revenue for the government in 2015-16 and represent a good balance between providing the programs and services Albertans need while protecting our low tax environment. As it stands today, Albertans will still enjoy a $10.9 billion tax advantage over the next closest Canadian jurisdiction. We know some Albertans will be critical of these revenue changes. However, without these increases, the future of many programs and services was at risk. Our government refuses to deepen our economic problems by cutting severely without the balance of revenue increases. I will say again, Alberta will continue to have the lowest overall tax load in Canada with no provincial sales tax. I've said for months now that the vulnerable Albertans would be protected in this budget. And I'm pleased to announce that we are also introducing plans to expand an existing tax credit for working families as well as introduce a new one. Starting July 1st, 2016, the Alberta Employment Tax Credit will be enhanced and we will create the new Alberta Working Family Supplement. These two tax credits, when fully implemented, will provide $110 million in new tax relief on top of what already exists and will be targeted at working families with lower to middle incomes and we estimate more than 85,000 families will benefit from this. Finally, I will address our government savings. We're fortunate to have a savings available 
to us in our contingency account. Our past prudent fiscal management set aside a reserve we can access for those rainy days such as today, and that is the point of the savings. The contingency account has a current balance of $6.5 billion, and we intend to access it to help counter the deficit we are facing. In the following year, we will continue to draw on these savings to the point where the balance in the account will reach $1 billion. After that, we forecast Alberta will return to surplus budgets, and we will again begin saving money in this account. By 2019-20 fiscal year, we will have the balance in this account at $5 billion. Then we can focus on savings in the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. The 10-year fiscal outlook indicates about $18 billion will be added to the Heritage Savings Trust Fund, more than doubling the value of the fund to over $34 billion by 2024-25. Albertans want us to save for future generations. We feel it is a moral obligation to our children and our grandchildren. We are accessing our short-term savings for current fiscal challenges, but we will rebuild for the future. I would like to finish by commenting on the format of today's budget. I want to point out that this budget is being presented in a fully consolidated basis that is supported by the Auditor General. This is an important change that reflects our government's commitment to transparency and public sector accounting standards. This has been one of the hardest budgets to develop in many years. It has required tough decisions, and it was not a reality we were expecting as recently as last fall. However, Albertans have elected us to lead and make decisions, and that is what we have done in a balanced and very thoughtful manner. I thank you for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, everyone. Uh, just uh, hang on one sec. So we're going to do one question and one follow-up and try to get in as many questions as we can. Uh, the first uh, person in the back. Hi, uh, Carolyn Dunn from CBC National News. I'm wondering if you are asking a pretty wide swath of Albertans to shoulder a little bit of this through cuts and... Uh, and uh, revenue generation, why do corporations not have to pay a little bit of that? Well, you know, corporations are paying. Uh, they pay every day. Uh, they create jobs for, for, our, for, the, uh, for the economy. We think that's important. Uh, we've seen the oil prices, uh, you know, drop off uh, to points we haven't seen in a very long time. Uh, especially when you look at conventional oil and gas, we have companies that are hanging on by a thread and trying to keep their employees working. Uh, we want to continue to uh, attract investment to the province. Right now, uh, you know, the competitive advantage that we had over the rest of Canada is very slim. And as we look at uh, diversifying our economy, especially, for example, in the petrochemical industry, we're not only competing with uh, neighboring provinces, but we're also competing with the southern states. So it would not be prudent at this time to look at raising corporate taxes. And the follow-up to that is, uh, were sales taxes ever really on the table? Is that something you can enter in elections? You know, we, uh, you know we, we looked at sales taxes, we talked about sales taxes. Uh, you know, I would suggest that, uh, you know, we, we heard more positive vote than we have in a long time, but Albertans were still unanimous that they didn't want a sales tax. And one of the things we also looked at as a government, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we take very seriously any tax increases at all that we're ra raising, because we know that people work hard for their money. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we're looking after government spending first. When I'm comfortable that we've got government spending to a level where I can say that we're getting the best bang for our tax dollars, we'll, we'll continue to have that conversation. Minister, on the, the flat tax for years has been a centerpiece of what the government has called the Alberta Advantage. How, uh, how much debate was there within government ranks and how difficult was the decision to ultimately uh, move back to a more progressive income tax? System? Well, I, you know, I, I I mean, I think that, first of all, I think a lot of people didn't understand the flat tax to begin with. And, you know, you know everybody said that, you know, there's a disadvantage to it. But as, as, under, the, under the current 10%, the more you made, the more you paid. So it was progressive in a sense. But when we looked at the uh, tax uh, tables, uh, and you see that 25% uh, of our burdens are paying 65% of our, our tax now, uh, you know, we just felt that it was something we needed to do uh, to, uh, to bring more revenue in because, again, uh, one thing Albertans were very clear about is they didn't want to see frontline services cut in health care or education. And we need revenue. Uh, you know, we have no money with, uh, with $7 billion out of uh, oil royalties not in our budget anymore. So, I mean, you know, it's not something we took very lightly and just decided to do it. I mean, there was, there was good discussion about it, but we thought it was one way that we could uh, raise revenues over, uh, over a period of time that wouldn't put a hurt on, uh, on our, our vulnerable or our working poor. Is there a concern that it will have a... a 
there's lots of talks that it has been uh, a way to attract people to the province over the years, high income earners. Is there any concern that this will, in fact, drive people away from the province, specifically people who, would, who make high income? No, because when you look at the, when you look at the tax uh, tables right across uh, Canada, we are still the lowest. We still have the lowest income taxes. We have the highest personal exemptions. So, you know, we felt comfortable that we were still in a very good space. Uh, that we will attract uh, high uh, people to, to come and work in high-paying jobs in the province. Minister, despite your talk of doom and gloom beforehand, you only cut real uh, spending by 0.7 percent in real dollars. So, is this province addicted to spending, really? Well, if you look at the numbers in the budget, and if you look at uh, over the next three years, you'll see that we're going to cut spending in the neighborhood of $4 billion. So when you look at a budget of about $42 billion, we're looking at almost 9%. So uh, asking uh, departments to absorb uh, population plus inflation growth, asking them to absorb the uh, contract negotiations and the wage increases, there's going to be real, there's going to be real pain to those decisions. So. Uh, what we've tried to do is, and again, talking to economists and talking uh, both in the United States and, and in Canada, they made it very clear to us to cut too deep too quick would put the province into recession. To raise revenue too quick would put the province into recession. Uh, they all feel that the approach that we are taking over the long term, over three years, is a very prudent approach, is very balanced, and uh, we can get to where we have to get to. Uh, understanding that Albertans want to make sure that their core services are looked after. Follow up. You know, the average Albertan, I think, who makes less than $100,000 is going to look at this budget and you're going to see the fuel tax, the liquor tax, the health care uh, levy, and then they're also going to see that bureaucrats and public sector workers are getting a raise. So I understand there's contracts involved. Can you just, you know, what would you like to say to those Albertans? Well, I, I think that, again, uh, we've, uh, we've taken a very thoughtful approach to middle class Albertans and, and working lower income, and that's why we brought in the tax credits to help uh, families with children. I think that, uh, you know, uh, we still have the lowest gas prices in the country, uh, and we're going to provide the core services they want. I mean, Alber Albertans were very clear that they, want, they didn't want to see health care cut, they didn't want to see education cut, and, uh, you know, we have to honor our agreements. You know, it's, it, it's, it's something we have to do. And, but again, once those agreements are over, we've, you know, we've already had discussions with the public sector unions, the Premier and myself and uh, other ministers sat down with the union leaders in the public sector and uh, we had a very, I thought, very respectful conversation. Uh, we want to be able to sit down with them when the contracts expire and have a very respectful uh, dialogue about what we can do to get our costs in line. And that doesn't mean that we have to look at uh, just wages. Are there, are there uh, efficiencies within, within departments that uh, frontline workers can help us with? I mean, you know, our, we have great public servants, and this isn't about going after the public service because they don't do their jobs. This is about, uh, you know, that our, our spending on public services is, is higher than the rest of Canada. We have a revenue issue. Uh, we need to get off the roller coaster of oil, and that's what this vision is about doing. All right, uh, Kim, Kim is next. But you said uh, Albertans were clear they didn't want to see any cuts in services in health and education. Yet, because of the budget, we're going to see fewer jobs in the healthcare system and in education, classrooms are going to be more crowded with perhaps fewer supports. So how do you justify the uh, budget decisions that were made specifically in education? Well, we, uh, again, we're keeping all of our teachers whole. We're honoring the contracts. Uh, there will be no layoffs for teachers in education. Uh, we've actually increased that budget. Uh, so, I mean, there's going to be some difficult decisions that school boards are going to have to make. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But again, we're, we're in times where we have to get our fiscal house in order. So I, I, have, uh, I have confidence in our minister. I have confidence uh, in, uh, in the school boards that will get, get it done. I understand that the minister uh, you know, has made sure that within, within his department we're taking a 9% administration cut. Uh, in health care, uh, one of the things we heard is that people thought that uh, health care was bloated. So we've, uh, the minister's worked very hard to uh, look where, where he could be, find efficiencies and save money, but without, without uh, causing any uh, issue with uh, frontline services moving forward. But what impact do you think there'll be in the classroom if you have fewer supports and there are more kids, even though you have a teacher? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not an education expert, and I, it's not my department. Uh, I will leave that up to Minister Dirks to, uh, to have those conversations and, uh, and what his thoughts are moving forward. Okay, uh, Darcy, you have a question in the back. Campbell. You're the first finance minister in decades to raise taxes in this province. 
<laughs> well, I'm also the first finance minister in the province to have a $7 billion hole in his revenue. Uh, also the first finance minister to, in the province that's seen unprecedented growth in Alberta over the last two years. So, uh, you know, uh, we need to look after the future of this province. The province is continue to grow. I think that uh, we've been very thoughtful uh, in our decisions. Uh, again, uh, I was very clear that I wasn't going to balance the budget on the back of the vulnerable or uh, low-income earners. We haven't done that. We're asking people that can pay a little bit more to pay a little bit more. We're going to continue to invest uh, $29 billion in infrastructure to meet our roads and bridges, hospitals and schools. Uh, I think it, you know, it shouldn't be lost on people that even with what we're talking about as far as some of the uh, efficiencies we're looking at and, and the increases in revenue we're asking some Albertans to pay, we're still going to spend over $48 billion on programs and services for Albertans in, in the coming year. So, uh, you know, it, it was a tough decision, but, uh, you know, uh, the Premier gave me a mandate and he put me in a position to make sure that we had a vision for the province looking out over the next 10 years and to make sure that we have a good fiscal framework uh, for our children and our grandchildren moving forward. This is a, this is a great province. And there's op lots of opportunity. We just have to make sure as a government that we have our fiscal house in order to be able to lead that. Uh, lead that. Do you think this budget is going to hit Albertans right in their wallets starting about midnight tonight with the gas tax? And there's booze taxes, taxes on smoke, marriage certificates, birth certificates, life uh, death certificates even. Um, everything, every time you come in contact with the state, you're going to be paying five bucks more, ten bucks more. How do you respond to Albertans who say, get out of my pocketbook already? Well, uh, I guess, I guess we had two choices. Uh, one choice is that we cut services and we laid people off. Uh, and I didn't think that was a very good choice. I think that uh, when you look at uh, some of the uh, increases that are, are coming forward, some of them haven't been touched in decades. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I mean, again, any time you, you know, I've always said that there's only one taxpayer, whether it's municipal, provincial, or federal, there's only one pocket, right? So we're very conscious of that. But uh, again, uh, in, in talking to Albertans, uh, they made it very clear that they didn't want to see services cut. And I think that we've taken a very balanced approach in the sense that we're looking at efficiencies, uh, we're making sure that we have frontline workers in place to do their jobs. Uh, you know, when you look at the three levers we're looking at, we're looking at 38% reduction in spending, we're looking at 24% increase in revenues, and we're looking at 37% use of our contingency fund. So I think we've taken a very balanced approach moving forward, and I think that when Albertans have a chance to sit down and look at the whole picture, uh, I don't expect them to be all thrilled about it, but I think they'll understand that we've, we've made some tough decisions uh, for the right reasons. The province is also taking on a great deal of debt, and I, my understanding from reading the documents in the next five years was going to be well over a billion dollars just in debt servicing costs. How do you justify that? Well, again, uh, you know, we had over 100,000 people come to Alberta last year. We're predicting another 80,000 this year. Uh, we have to maintain our assets. We have to build schools. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to do work on our hospitals. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we have good roads in place. Uh, you know, as, as an export province uh, that depends on getting our goods to market, uh, not only do we need safe roads for Albertans to travel on, but we need good roads for, to, uh, to move, move our goods and services. These are all, uh, these are all aspects that, uh, that Albertans uh, expect and, and, and need and deserve. So, uh, and again, with the economy and the state it's in, uh, if we can continue to grow, uh, to uh, build infrastructure, we're going to create jobs and we're going to keep Albertans working. And I think that if you talk to people in the construction industry or in the building trades, they're going to be very happy to see that we're spending that money to continue to build the province. Okay, so we have a question in the back and then we're going to get to Calgary. How much of this budget is basically cleaning up from the last two Red Bull era budgets? We're talking about a heavy reliance on oil prices that uh, were very high projections and those contracts that you're now obliged to sign. So how much of this is basically a cleanup from those Red Bull era budgets? You know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't spend a lot of time thinking backwards. Uh, you know, uh, finance ministers in the past have made decisions based on the information that was in front of them and, 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 and the situation they were in. Uh, just like, uh, you know, uh, our government uh, under, our, under our Premier have to make decisions today based on the situation we're in. So uh, we're looking forward. You can't change the past. Uh, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time looking in the back, in the, in the mirror behind me. I, I'm looking forward to the province over the next 10 years. I think there's lots of opportunity. This is the greatest place in Canada to live. It's our job as a province to show leadership and, and make sure that we provide those opportunities for people who want to come and live in Alberta. 
Well, we, we well again. I, I think the, uh, the the key message is number one is that we have a ten-year fiscal plan, which, which the province has never done before. I think the other is is that we're going to get off of oil. Uh, our our uh, our budget, as you see, the ten years is we're going to depend less and less on oil for our operating budget, and we're doing that so that when times are good, we can put more money into savings or build more infrastructure. And times are bad, we aren't going to have the discussion about whether or not we have to cut services. So that's where we want to get to uh, over the next ten years. Okay, we have a question on the line from Calgary. Go ahead. Uh, Dylan Robertson from the Calgary Herald here. I've got one question and one follow-up. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, with all these new fees that are coming in, do you think Albertans are going to feel nickel and dimed by the government? Well, again, I, I, I mean, every, every individual is going to have different circumstances. Uh, you know, when they look at the budget, uh, depending on what their lifestyle is. So, uh, you, know, I, you know, each individual is, is going to look at things differently. Uh, again, uh, you know, I think uh, we've been very thoughtful in the decisions we've made. Uh, a number of the fees that we're looking at increasing, as I said, haven't been touched in a very long period of time. Uh, and so, you know, what, one of the things I'd like to get to the point at eventually is that, you know, when we charge fees, we're recouping the cost of those fees. Uh, but we can't do that overnight, and it's going to take us a period of time to get to where we want to get to. So uh, over the next three years, uh, you'll, you'll see as we move along that we're holding spending in line. Uh, we're going to be very thoughtful in any increases that happen, but at the end of the three years, we'll be back into a balanced budget. And we'll be able to start putting money into our savings and, and start to pay down the uh, infrastructure debt that, uh, that we're borrowing for the next five years for the capital plan. And, uh, some of these things come into effect uh, tomorrow, like the, the gas and uh, alcohol fees. Um, do you think people are going to be angry at the government now that there's an election looming? No, I, I think, again, I think that uh, when you look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the gas tax, uh, you know, it's still the lowest in Canada. Uh, again, uh, when you look at the infrastructure build that we're going to do for roads and bridges, uh, you know, I think people can feel comfortable that their money is being well spent. Uh, you know, uh, alcohol, I mean, uh, you know, I guess some people will be upset if their favorite bottle of wine wine's a little bit more or a six-pack of beer. I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I don't indulge, so I can't really say. But, uh, uh, you know, again, everybody's circumstances is going to be a little different. Uh, we have a question across uh, the room. Uh, you, you use the word prudent in a lot of things, and I just want to circle back to the, the oil price estimates. I mean, within three years, you're seeing oil prices go back above $80 a barrel. Um, and, and you're also, if you look at the, uh, the um, production of bitumen going up 52% over five years, I mean, that, that seems like a pretty aggressive increase based on the fact that nobody knows where the oil price is going. Some people are skeptical that it'll go that high. And, you know, we don't have the export pipelines that we need for that kind of volume of oil. So how do you reconcile that? I mean, it seems like a pretty big bet that you're making. Well, that's one of the reasons we, uh, as you see going forward, that we're reducing our operating uh, budget depending on oil. And that's why we're doing that, because, you know, oil is so volatile. So right now, you've got the Saudis bombing Yemen, right? So the price of oil has went up a couple of dollars a barrel. So people are saying, you know, wait, you know we're, we're out of this. Well, the fact matters, we're not. It can drop just as quickly. So, so one of the things that we have done through the budget is, is that over the 10-year plan is that we're going to get off of oil each year. And we'll be able to depend less and less on that again, because I think we need, uh, Albertans want certainty and they want stability within their programming, especially the core services. So, uh, so uh, this year I think we're budgeting $52.64 for oil. Uh, next year we're looking in the $60, $62 range, and I think three years out we're about $75. Uh, I don't expect to see oil up over uh, $80 in the near future at all. Uh, if it does, it'll be a short blip, uh, and we're not going to, uh, you know, risk uh, everything that we're doing as far as getting our, our fiscal uh, foundation in order. We're not going to risk that just because oil was up one year. And how much of that, that increase in bitumen exports is premised on having one or two of the big pipelines that are proposed being built? Like that? Well, you're seeing actually, well, you're going to see uh, uh, pr production continue to increase, but you're also seeing uh, innovative ways of getting oil to the Gulf Coast. So, for example, the rail capacity is increasing. Uh, there's pipelines built now from North Dakota to the, to the uh, Gulf Coast that sort of go outside of Keystone. So, uh, you know, so uh, 
the energy companies are looking at innovative ways to get oil oil to market. You know, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still hopeful uh, that the Keystone will go built. It, it, it makes sense, it, uh, especially if you see what's going on in the Middle East right now with the instability that's going on there. I mean, it's going to make more and more sense for uh, for uh, the United States to continue to buy uh, oil from from Canada. I mean, it, it's the closest to them. We're stable. We're good neighbors. Uh, you know, there's jobs for both. So it just makes sense uh, in the long run. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still confident that we'll see that happen. And again, we've had very good discussions uh, with, uh, with our counterparts in the East on the Energy East pipeline. Uh, it makes economic sense for both uh, Quebec and New Brunswick uh, for that to happen. And again, uh, Premier uh, Prentice is, is continuing to, uh, to talk with uh, uh, Premier Clark in BC. And uh, so, you know, these things are going to take some time, but uh, you know, I'm comfortable that with the leadership of our Premier, we'll get to where we need to get to. So you have the question in the front. <laughs> Minister, how does the debt on the balance sheet in the coming years compare to what you've had in the past? Uh, we're carrying a little bit more debt. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're put, spending more money on maintenance of infrastructure than we ever have before. Uh, so uh, making sure that the assets we have are maintained. And again, uh, you know, we have the largest uh, school build any time ever in Canadian history. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's going to add to it. And again, we're going to continue uh, getting the road to Fort McMurray twinned. Uh, we need to do some work in our, in our hospitals uh, around the province. So uh, we're, we're going to carry a little bit more debt. But again, uh, by keeping, holding our operating budget uh, in line over the next three years, and making sure that we get off of the oil roller coaster, we'll be able to uh, accelerate paying down that debt. So when we, at the end of 2024, or 24, 25, our debt will be down to about $11 billion, which is about where it is right now. Is too much debt the provinces carry? I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. Okay, so we have uh, John, who's been waiting patiently. Uh, Minister, um, just to ask an earlier question in a different sort of way. Uh, you recently released the results of uh, the public survey that you asked for um, public to give their opinions about what to do with this budget. Roughly 40,000 people replied. Roughly 30,000 of them said, raise corporate taxes. On behalf of those 30,000 people, why did you bother to include that as an option when it appears you had your mind made up ahead of time? Well, no, we didn't have our mind made up ahead of time at all. And I mean, when we put the survey out, I mean, things have changed dramatically over the last little while and continue to change. Uh, you know, uh, we're seeing every day uh, companies uh, pulling back on their capital projects. Uh, we're seeing uh, more and more layoffs. Uh, and again, you know, when you look at corporations, you know, everybody tends to talk about the big oil companies. We also have a number of small corporations in the province, you know, 50 employees less. And, you know, they're going to suffer also. We're, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, incomes halved and people still trying to keep their employees working. So, you know, they're, they're, they're just, it's just not the time uh, within uh, Alberta right now to be talking about raising corporate taxes. Again, uh, you know, uh, we'd have to raise corporate taxes uh, by 15% to, uh, to fill the hole. Because for every 1% of corporate tax you raise, it's about $400 million. So to fill that hole, we'd have to raise, it. we'd be the highest corporate taxes in the country. Fair point. I don't think that the people responding to the survey were suggesting to fill the hole only with corporate taxes. But to your point about not having your main mind made up ahead of time, if 79% of the respondents said raise corporate taxes, what percentage would you have needed to see in order to move corporate taxes a little bit higher? If not 79%, what would you need? 85, 90, everybody? Well, I'd need to see the economy in a little better situation, and I need to make sure that corporations aren't going to shut their doors because we raised those corporate taxes. That's what I'd need to see. Okay, we have a question by the podium. Uh, Minister, is this it for, for tax hikes, or can Albertans expect more tax hikes in the next two to five years? No, I, th I think that uh, if, uh, if we stick to our plan and if we're disciplined in holding our spending over the next three years and, and start to run surpluses, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. Uh, Bill? You said that you, you were ensuring you didn't have to make that big cuts, but if you look at page 121 of the budget, AHS uh, eliminates close to 1,700 positions, FTE positions. How do you explain that and what are those positions? Some of those positions were positions that were empty, so we've, we've, also, we've, we've also actually been able to... Uh, reduced by not filling jobs. So a number of those jobs were uh, uh, empty already. Uh, so, so that helped us. Uh, some will be through attrition, we have people retiring. We won't fill those jobs. 
Uh, but again, let me make it clear that we're going to make sure that our frontline services are there for Albertans. How many layoffs, how many, it's followed, how many layoffs do you think in AHS? 1,700 is a big number. 1,695, I think it was. It's yeah. a lot for attrition. Well, uh, but again, uh, we're looking at, uh, at attrition. We're looking at some of the middle management uh, jobs. Uh, you know, uh, you've got to remember, uh, we're looking at over 100,000 people in AHS. Can you say no nurses? Can you say no frontline health care staff? Uh, I, you'd have to talk to the minister about that. He, he, he'd, be, he'd be able to go into his budget a little more deeply. You said there will be no frontline losses. I mean, what, so you, are you saying then that there will be no frontline workers that will lose their jobs or have their jobs replaced? I'm saying that we're not going to reduce any frontline services. Is what I've said. I didn't say anything about. How do you monitor that? I mean, how does that? How do you ensure that is actually happening? Well, again, the, the ministers will, in their departments, will give instructions to the to the folks that they have, and they'll move forward with. Uh, with those decisions, and they'll make they'll make uh, recommendations as we go through this process. Again, uh, within health services, uh, the minister has, has been working very hard, looking at efficiencies and looking at what we have to do to uh, to improve our health our health care in the province. Uh, you know, we spend 43 percent of our budget on health care, and people aren't happy with it. There's a, there's a disconnect there, so he's working very hard on that uh, to find efficiencies. Uh, he's he's sat down. Uh, with uh, with uh, healthcare workers, and uh, he's he's a, an individual that wants to uh, have a meaningful dialogue and, and have people from the front lines actually give advice on what the best way to move forward is. Okay, uh, hey, Graham, Graham, go ahead. Election in the next few weeks, perhaps. Are we? Yeah, I don't know. But this will be part of your election platform if elections called. Will this be a hard sell to make to Albertans? You know, I, I think that. Uh, uh, I think I think it's a pretty balanced approach. You know, I, I I have myself personally, I have no issue going to the doors of my riding and selling this. I think that uh, we have looked after our most vulnerable. We've looked after low-income families. Uh, we've we people have asked us to get our spending in check. We're doing that. Uh, we're not putting any real hardship on any part of the sector, or any on any uh, on any uh, tax group. Uh, we've taken a a, a long-term approach to this to make sure that. Uh, you know, at 0.4% growth in the economy, it's going to feel like a recession, but we're not in a recession. Uh, and, you know, I, in my riding, I look at the natural resource industries that I have in my riding. In all my communities, they're all based on natural resources. Uh, so I look at uh, what's happening out there in the real world and, and people losing their jobs. Uh, I think that this will give people hope. Uh, I think it gives people uh, an idea of the stability that they're going to see over the next 10 years. And I think that uh, it's going to give people the ability to see that we're actually going to be able to save money, we're going to be able to continue to build infrastructure, but we're going to keep our government spending in check. So I, myself, personally, I, I feel very comfortable going to the door selling this. We have a so you're happy to have this as an election platform. What's that? So you're happy to have this budget as part of the election platform? I election every day, Graham. So, I mean, everything I do is an election platform. So, you know, I, but I, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in my riding. I, I talk to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time across the province, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, we've, done a, we've done a pretty good job of balancing this over the next three years so that we don't put any real hardship on people. Just hang on, sorry. We have a question over here. You're, you're selling this 10 years plan with a record high deficit and a record high borrowing as well. How confident are you that you will be able to answer doubts? about your ability to uh, go back to surpluses and savings in the future? Well, uh, again, uh, you know, the, the plan, the numbers are there. It's going to take discipline. Uh, you know, I have uh, complete confidence in our Premier that uh, he has the discipline to make this happen. Uh, you know, him and I, uh, when he made me the Finance Minister in September, uh, we sat down and, and we had a discussion of where we thought we had to go as a province where we had to go with our finances and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, I continue to be the finance minister for a little while longer uh, and I, I've got the discipline and I've got the backbone to make this happen. It, it's, it's in the best interest of our children and our grandchildren. Our Premier has been very clear. As, as a province, we can't continue to spend our children's money. It, it, it has to end and we're going to make that happen. Health care, you actually are reducing funding a little bit this year. When you talked to the minister, did he give you any indication of how he would manage that while at the same time uh, dealing with the pressures on emergency rooms and surgery backlogs and all of that? Yeah, he has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you talk to him about it. Uh, Mr. Minister, okay, how might call, you, if I may, We have a call on the line from Calgary. 
Miriam, stand in front of the camera so we can see you. <laughs> Sorry, Miriam. Can we go to Calgary? You have a question? Uh, hi, Minister. It's Trevor Howell from the Calgary Herald. Uh, a couple questions on post-secondary education. Uh, in your speech that you note that your, uh, the government's going to be discussing with stakeholders a review of tuition fees and uh, revenue generation options. I mean, so should Alberta students be prepared for the government to remove the tuition cap? And my second question, uh, again, in your speech, you note that uh, you're going to have to work with post-secondaries to identify and shed low-value programs that do not represent good return on investment. What are those programs? Again, you'll, have to, you'll have to talk to the Minister of Advanced Education about that. On both? Yeah. Well, it's his department. Thanks. And as Minister, we're looking for ideas to what that means. It sounds like a philosophical well, have, have, policy statement. I have lots of ideas, but I mean, the fact of the matter is I've asked each minister to go into their departments. I've asked them to look at where they can find efficiencies. I've asked them to look where they can generate revenue. So uh, he'd be the individual to talk to. He's more... Uh, in tune exactly what he wants to do. Miriam, you had a question, sorry. Thank you. Um, how would you respond to critics who say that when you look at all of the new taxes, new user fees, the new health care contribution, that this budget actually hits middle income uh, Albertans the hardest, you know, uh, as Karen was saying, with the pocketbook, with the health care levy, with the, you know, taking out the income tax uh, uh, increases, you know, for the top earners in the, in the province. How would you respond to people who say this is actually going to hit the, the the well, again, uh, you don't you don't start paying the increase in income taxes until you're above a hundred thousand dollar taxable income. So I think that uh, when you look at the taxpayers within the province, I think we've done a very good job of, of doing that. So, what uh, taxes and all the yeah, so you're looking at about two hundred and sixty one dollars a year increase. So that's less than a, less than a penny a day, or sorry, a dollar a day. Okay, and we're going to just uh, take one final question in the back because the minister does have to get into the assembly. Sure, sure. I'm trying to clarify to Chris Epple, CTV Calgary. Earlier, my understanding was that the money from that health levy is not necessarily directed towards health costs. It goes into general revenue. Is that correct? Well, the money will, the money will come into general revenue, and then we'll, uh, we'll direct it where it has to go. Why call it a health levy, then? It could be an education levy. Is that just more palatable for people if they think that's going towards health? So it's basically just going into government coffers, right? Well, there's some legal ramifications around it, too. So it is legally you are required to put that exact amount back into health services? No, no, there's, there's uh, legal uh, requirements around what you call it. Why don't you just call it a tax or a fee? Because call it a tax is that is what it there, is. There, right? there, we, we've called it what we have to call it because of what we've asked to do by justice. Can you expand on that? Why is it, is it a health tax if the money is not going to health? Well, it will eventually get there, but there's, there's, there's ways you have to do it. All right, so that's that's all, folks. We have to Sorry? get him into the house. Put together, is this the largest tax hike in the province's history? Mm, I don't think so. I, I could check for you. Okay. All right, thanks, Good. everyone.